Section 9 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. Sand. Chapter 1. As Felix Henriot came through the streets that January night, the fog was stifling. But when he reached his little flat upon the top floor, there came a sound of wind. Wind was stirring about the world. It blew against his windows, but at first so faintly that he hardly noticed it. Then, with an abrupt rise and fall, like a wailing voice that sought to claim attention, it called him. He peered through the window into the blurred darkness, listening. There is no cry in the world like that of the homeless wind. A vague excitement, scarcely to be analysed, ran through his blood. The curtain of fog waved momentarily aside. Henriot fancied a star peeped down at him. "'It will change things a bit, at last,' he sighed, settling back into his chair. "'It will bring movement.' Already something in himself had changed. A restlessness as that of wandering wind woke in his heart. The desire to be off and away. Other things could rouse this wildness, too. Falling water, the singing of a bird, an odour of wood-fire.' a glimpse of winding road, but the cry of the wind, always searching, questioning, travelling the world's great routes, remained ever the master touch. High longing took his mood in hand. Mid seven millions he felt suddenly lonely. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway or in the pavement's grey. I hear it in the deep heart's core. He murmured the words over softly to himself. The emotion that produced Innisfree passed strongly through him. He too would be over the hills and far away. He craved movement, change, adventure, somewhere far from shops and crowds and motor buses. For a week the fog had stifled London. This wind brought life. Where should he go? Desire was long, his purse was short. He glanced at his books, letters, newspapers. They had no interest now. Instead, he listened. The panorama of other journeys rolled in colour through the little room, flying on one another's heels. Henriot enjoyed this remembered essence of his travels more than the travels themselves. The crying wind brought so many voices, all of them seductive. There was a soft crashing of waves upon the black seashores, where the huge carcasses beckoned in the sky beyond. A rustling in the umbrella pines and cactus at Marseilles, whence magic steamers start about the world like flying dreams. He heard the plash of fountains upon Mount Ida's slopes, and the whisper of the tamarisk on Marathon. It was dawn once more upon the Ionian Sea, and he smelt the perfume of the Kyclades. Blue-veiled islands melted in the sunshine, and across the dewy lawns of temper moistened by the spray of many waterfalls, he saw, great heavens above, the dancing of white forms. Or was it only the mist the sunshine painted against Pelion? Methought among the lawns together we wandered underneath the young grey dawn, and multitudes of dense white fleecy clouds shepherded by the slow, unwilling wind. And then, into his stuffy room, slipped the singing perfume of a wallflower on a ruined tower, and with it the sweetness of hot ivy. He heard the yellow bees and the ivy bloom. Wind whipped over the open hills, this very wind that laboured drearily through the London fog. And he was caught. The darkness melted from the city. The fog whisked off into an azure sky. The roar of traffic turned into the booming of the sea. There was a whistling among cordage, and the floor swayed to and fro. He saw a sailor touch his cap and pocket the two-franc piece. The siren hooted. Ominous sound that had started him on many a journey of adventure. And the roar of London became mere insignificant clatter of a child's toy carriages. He loved that siren's call. There was something deep and pitiless in it. It drew the wanderers forth from cities everywhere. Leave your known world behind you, and come with me for better or for worse. The anchor is up. It is too late to change, only beware. You shall know curious things, and alone. 
Henriot stirred uneasily in his chair. He turned with a sudden energy to the shelf of guidebooks, maps, and timetables, possessions he most valued in the whole room. He was a happy-go-lucky, adventure-loving soul, careless of common standards, a thirst ever for the new and strange. "'That's the best of having a cheap flat,' he laughed. "'And no ties in the world. I can turn the key and disappear. No one cares or knows. No one but the thieving caretaker, and he's long ago found out that there's nothing here worth taking.' There followed, then, no lengthy indecision. Preparation was even shorter still. He was always ready for a move, and his sojourn in cities was but breathing space while he gathered pennies for further wanderings. An enormous kit-bag, sack-shaped, very worn and dirty, emerged speedily from the bottom of a cupboard in the wall. It was of limitless capacity. The key and padlock rattled in its depths. Cigarette ashes covered everything while he stuffed it full of ancient, indescribable garments— and his voice, singing of those yellow bees and the ivy bloom, mingled with the crying of the rising wind about his windows. His restlessness had disappeared by magic. This time, however, there could be no haunted Pelion, nor shady groves of temper, for he lived in sophisticated times when money markets regulated movement sternly. Travelling was only for the rich, mere wanderers must pig it. He remembered instead an opportune invitation to the desert— objective invitation his genial hosts had called it knowing his hatred of convention and halloran danced into letters of brilliance upon the inner map of his mind for egypt had ever held his spirit in thrall though as yet he had tried in vain to touch the great buried soul of her the excavators the egyptologists the archaeologists most of all plastered her grey ancient face with labels like hotel advertisements on travellers portmanteau they told where she had come from last, but nothing of what she dreamed and thought and loved. The heart of Egypt lay beneath the sand, and the trifling robbery of little details that poked forth from tombs and temples brought no true revelation of her stupendous spiritual splendour. Henriot, in his youth, had searched and dived among what material he could find, believing once, or half-believing, that the ceremonial of that ancient system veiled a weight of symbol that was reflected from genuine supersensual knowledge. The rituals, now taken literally and so pityingly explained away, had once been genuine pathways of approach. But never yet, and least of all in his previous visits to Egypt itself, had he discovered one single person worthy of speech who caught at his idea. Curious, they said, then turned away to go on digging in the sand. Sand smothered her world today. Excavators discovered skeletons. Museums everywhere stored them, grinning literal relics that told nothing. But now, while he packed and sang, these hopes of enthusiastic younger days stirred again, because the emotion that gave them birth was real and true in him. Through the morning mists upon the Nile, an old pyramid bowed hugely at him across London roofs. Come, he heard its awful whisper beneath the ceiling. I have things to show you and to tell. He saw the flock of them sailing the desert like a weird, grey, solemn ship that makes no earthly port, and he imagined them as one, multiple expressions of some single unearthly portent they adumbrated in mighty form, dead symbols of some spiritual conception long vanished from the world. I mustn't dream like this, he laughed, or I shall get absent-minded and pack fire-tongs instead of boots. It looks like a jumble sale already, and he stood on a heap of things to wedge them down still tighter. But the pictures would not cease. He saw the kites circling high in the blue air. A couple of white vultures flapped lazily away over shining miles. Feluca sails, like giant wings emerging from the ground, curved toward him from the Nile. The palm trees dropped long shadows over Memphis. He felt the delicious drenching heat and the camasin that overwind from Nubia brushed his very cheeks. In the little garden the mishmish was in bloom. He smelt the desert grey sepulchre of cancelled cycles. The stillness of her interminable reaches dropped down upon old London. The magic of the sand stole round him in its silent-footed tempest. And while he struggled with that strange, capacious sack, the piles of clothing ran into shapes of gleaming Bedouin faces. London garments settled down with the mournful sound of camel's feet, half-dropping wind, half-water flowing underground. 
sound that old time has brought over into modern life and left a moment for our wonder and perhaps our tears. He rose at length with the excitement of some deep enchantment in his eyes. The thought of Egypt plunged ever so deeply into him, carrying him into depths where he found it difficult to breathe, so strangely far away it seemed, yet undefinably familiar. He lost his way. A touch of fear came with it. "'A sack like that is the wonder of the world,' he laughed again, kicking the unwieldy sausage-shaped monster into a corner of the room, and sitting down to write the thrilling labels, "'Felix Henriot, Alexandria via Marseille.' But his pen blotted the letters. There was sand in it. He rewrote the words. Then he remembered a dozen things he had left out. Impatiently, yet with confusion somewhere, he stuffed them in. They ran away into shifting heaps. They disappeared. They emerged suddenly again. It was like packing hot, dry-flowing sand. From the pockets of a coat, he had worn it last summer down Dorset Way, out trickled sand. There was sand in his mind and thoughts. And his dreams that night were full of winds, the old sad winds of Egypt and of moving, sifting sand. Arabs and Afrits danced amazingly together across dunes he could never reach, for he could not follow fast enough. Something infinitely older than these ever caught his feet and held him back. A million tiny fingers stung and pricked him. Something flung a veil before his eyes. Once it touched him, his face and hands and neck. "'Stay here with us,' he heard a host of muffled voices crying, but their sound was smothered, buried, rising through the ground. A myriad throats were choked, till at last, with a violent effort, he turned and seized it. And then the thing he grasped at slipped between his fingers and ran easily away. It had a grey and yellow face, and it moved through all its parts. It flowed as water flows, and yet was solid. It was centuries old. He cried out to it. "'Who are you? What is your name? I surely know you, but I have forgotten.' And it stopped, turning from far away its great uncovered countenance of nameless colouring. He caught a voice. It rolled and boomed and whispered like the wind, and then he woke with a curious shaking in his heart and a little touch of chilly perspiration on the skin. But the voice seemed in the room still, close beside him. "'I am the sand.' he heard, before it died away. And next he realised that the glitter of Paris lay behind him, and a steamer was taking him with much unnecessary motion across a sparkling sea toward Alexandria. Gladly he saw the Riviera fade below the horizon with its hard, bright sunshine, treacherous winds, and its smear of rich, conventional English. All restlessness now had left him, True vagabond still at forty, he felt only the unrest and discomfort of life when caught in the network of routine and rigid streets, no chance of breaking loose. He was off again at last, money scarce enough indeed, but the joy of wandering expressing itself in happy emotions of release. Every warning of calculation was stifled. He thought of the American woman who walked out of a Long Island house one summer's day to look at a passing sail and was gone eight years before she walked in again. Eight years of roving travel. He had always felt respect and admiration for that woman, for Felix Henriot, with his admixture of foreign blood, was philosopher as well as vagabond, a strong poetic and religious strain sometimes breaking out through fissures in his complex nature. He had seen much life and read many books, the passionate desire of youth to solve the world's big riddles had given place to a resignation filled to the brim with wonder. Anything might be true. Nothing surprised him. The most outlandish beliefs, for all he knew, might fringe truth somewhere. He had escaped that cheap cynicism with which disappointed men sued their vanity when they realised that an intelligible explanation of the universe lies beyond their powers— he no longer expected final answers. For him, even the smallest journeys held the spice of some adventure. All minutes were loaded with enticing potentialities, and they shaped for themselves somehow a dramatic form. "'It's like a story,' his friend said when he told his travels. It always was a story. But the adventure that lay waiting for him where the silent streets of little Helouin kissed the great desert's lips was of a different kind— to any Henriot had yet encountered. Looking back, he has often asked himself, 
how in the world can I accept it? And perhaps he never yet has accepted it. It was sand that brought it. For the desert, the stupendous thing that mother's little heroine produced it. End of chapter one of Sand.